Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. All right, we'd like to welcome everyone uh, here this morning as we praise our God. Uh, I invite you to, uh, to stand for our next couple of songs <clears throat> and to sing with your heart because uh, we are in the presence of, of God this morning. Soldiers of Christ, prayer. Uh, please be seated. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to come together for worship, for fellowship, for prayer, for teaching, for communion. All of these things that you have asked us to do, we pray that as we do these things, we learn, we take that opportunity to go out in our community and in our workplace, and through our words and actions, people will know that we are Christians and that we might lead them to the opportunity to know Jesus. Father, we ask also that you bless the leaders of our country and our state, that they would make good decisions and that we would all be able to come together better than we have in the last few years. We thank you for the many blessings that you've allowed our church, the growth that we've incurred and the many opportunities that we've had in the mission field to expand our work. We thank you for all of these things, Father, and bless our lives as you have. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh
this will be our song before uh, communion. Let us pray. Dear kind, gracious Father, we come before thee, thanking you for another glorious day that you bless us with. Father, that our mind go back to the cross where Jesus was on that cross and shed his blood for our sins. And we think about the body that was on that cross. And that body represents the, uh, the bread that we're about to take. Let us take it with clean mind and clean heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord of ours, thank you for this life and my wife who brought me to your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the souls you've placed around me to love and be loved. Father, as we drink this wine from the fruit of the vine, we do so in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who died on the cross for our sins. Bless us sinners and have mercy on our souls. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. Scripture reading today will be from Luke chapter 4, verses 20, 14 to 21. 
Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread, spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were, fast, were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. song before Mike's lesson, so again, if it's convenient, if you'd please stand as we sing. thought I knew all the church songs. I don't think I've ever heard that song before, but that's a really good one, and it goes along with what we'll be talking about today, the theme of the Holy Spirit. We're glad to have all of you here today, and some of you are joining us online, and uh, we're just thankful that everybody is here today. I do have a good announcement. We have some people who want to place membership at our church. Membership means they want to be active, committed people who are a part of this church, and most people in here know who they are because they were members here before 
kind of like the prodigal son, and they went away, and now they're coming back, and we're glad that they're here. David and Lori Blaylock, sitting right behind Jim and Donna Beth there. Most of you know them. They're coming back. Uh, Laura and I and Jakey and Judy uh, had a dinner with them on Friday night and talked with them, and uh, they want to reconnect with this church, and we're, we're happy to have you all. If you don't know David and Lori, make sure that you get to know them before they leave today, and if you do know them, make sure that you re welcome them back to the part of the family here at the Landmark Church of Christ. One thing I'm committed to doing every uh, beginning of every sermon this year is to get us focused on the Word of God. This is one of the great passages in Scripture about the importance of us being open to what God's Word says. Acts 17, 11, talking about these people who lived in this city of Berea, says they, were, they received the Word with all eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. I pray that you will do that. Whatever I say up here, I pray that you will get your Bible out, and not just today, but daily, every day, that you will examine what has been said today or what I or anybody else who teaches here says and see if those things are so. We want to be people who are of God's Word. Amen? We want to follow what God's Word says. And to help us follow what God's Word says, we love children at this church. We have been in the midst of a baby boom for years here, and that's wonderful because if you have a church that does not have any children, your church is in deep, deep trouble. Fortunately, God has blessed us. We have a bunch of kids. However, if your child starts getting really fussy and their children aren't doing anything wrong, they're kids. That's what kids do. That's what little babies do. They cry. But if they begin doing so while I'm trying to teach up here, it brings a competition. And I have noticed the competition, the baby always wins. So we have some cry rooms back here, and we have a nursery at the north end of the church building where you can see and hear everything. There's a monitor in there. You can see and hear everything that's going on. So if that's the case, if you would take advantage of that, we would really, really appreciate it. Um, we're talking about Jesus this year. There's nothing more important for us to focus on. We want to focus on Jesus and especially, we want to try to live the way that he lived. He showed us an example. Jesus set us an example for how it is that we are to live. And of course, our living for Jesus begins when we are converted, when we're baptized based on our faith and our desire to live a, a life of repentance following him. I'll never forget when I was baptized. It has been almost exactly 40 years ago. Next month will be 40 years. I was 18 years old. I was under the impression, this is what I really thought at the time. I thought this is going to be so great, and it was. I thought not only are my sins going to be forgiven, which that's true, but I thought I'm going to be done with all my struggle with sin and all my little idiosyncrasy problems that I have that aren't Christ-like that we all have, all my habits that aren't Christ-like. Those will be done as soon as I come up out of the waters of baptism. That's what I thought. Well, I don't know about you, but it didn't turn out that way for me. Uh, actually, as I began studying Scripture a lot more, I knew nothing at the time, hardly, I discovered not only are we given the Holy Spirit, the presence of God at baptism, so we have a new nature to help us live holy, but we still struggle with that old nature, don't we? And what we want to see is how to live in a way that Jesus asked us to live. And it really goes along with the Holy Spirit. Uh, this verse in Luke chapter 4 that we brought up last week, talking about the baptism of Jesus, right after he was baptized, it says Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, and he returned from the Jordan River, and he was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The secret to Jesus' success in the wilderness and overcoming those temptations was that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And a little bit later in Luke's Gospel, he says, when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came, and then Jesus returned to Galilee, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit's power. The secret to Jesus' amazing life and his amazing uh, being able to follow God's will perfectly was that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in the New Testament, the followers of Jesus, the apostles of Jesus, left us letters to read. And they say in these letters that it's God's will that we also do the same thing. Paul said it this way, be careful how you live. 
Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as I explained last week, the comparison and contrast that he has given here is we all know what people who are drunk act like. They don't act like themselves, do they? They were overcome with something else, with a substance. We call them being under the influence, exactly. What he's saying is, I don't want you to be under the influence of wine or any other substance. I want you to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit so that you also act differently. You act as people who are led and guided by the Holy Spirit. The problem is, I think sometimes we don't understand what that means. There's a lot of confusion in America in general about the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does, and what it looks like when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. I'll never forget when I was a teenager, like 13 years old, my mom and dad had gotten divorced, and we had a stepdad, and he, was, uh, he had a charismatic background of a church of God or a Pentecostal church or something. And I know some of you have that background as well. Uh, and so we went to church there, and everything was going along what I thought was pretty normal until all of a sudden just what I perceived to be chaos broke out, and they were doing now what, I, uh, what people call speaking in tongues. And it was everybody just loud, a cacophony of noise, and it scared me and my little sister to death. I mean, we crawled under the pews, and I, I, I came away thinking, is that what the Holy Spirit is? Is that what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And then other people think that being filled with the Holy Spirit means that you, you live a completely different kind of life in the way that you dress. Like, uh, I never forget on spring break in college one time, uh, we went to an Amish community up in near uh, Philadelphia in, in the rural part of Pennsylvania. And it was the horse and buggies, no electricity, the, the old clothing, you know, all very simple way of living. I thought, is that what the Holy Spirit means? Some people think that. Uh, other people think that the Holy Spirit means as you're going about your daily life, you wear special clothing. You might have noticed if you're at Walmart here, there are people sometimes who walk around in Walmart and they have very simple clothing on. And other people who are religious people have priestly kind of clothing on. Is that what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit? When I was uh, uh, back in 1981, after I was baptized, I, for whatever reason, God impressed upon me I needed to become a minister, so I began uh, training for that. And I was working at a clothing store, C.R. Anthony's. I don't know if any of you remember that, but I sold clothing. And as I was at this store, there was a, it became known throughout the store that I was eventually going to be a preacher. And I remember there was a lady that worked in the, in the shoe department one time, and she, she came up to me and she said, I thought you were going to be a preacher. And I said, I am. I, that's, that's what I want to do. I believe that's what God wants me to do with my life. And she said, you don't look like a preacher. And I said, what? I don't know what that means. What do you mean? She goes, I see you laughing. I see you telling jokes. They were clean jokes, I promise. I see you kind of having a good time. And I said, yes. She didn't see that as being consistent with being a person who is full of the Holy Spirit. So what we want to look at today, what Luke is going to show us, what does it mean when we are full of the Holy Spirit? What does a life that is full of the Holy Spirit look like? Jesus is going to show us what it looks like. And this is a really good lesson for all of us. So I hope we we'll all pay close attention. He starts off by saying this, which John did a good job of reading in the scripture reading a moment ago. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Right here, Jesus gives us one aspect of it. It was Jesus' custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Now, to put it in modern language, Jesus went to church every Sunday. Now, the Sabbath was on Saturday. I'm just making an analogy today. It was Jesus' custom to go to gatherings like this where they also said prayers, 
where they read scripture, where there was teaching from God's word, that was Jesus' custom. In other words, this is what he did all the time. Brothers and sisters, churches aren't perfect, that is true, but it is God's will for us, if we're going to be filled with the Spirit, for us to gain the necessary encouragement and instruction that we need, it's necessary for us to be gathered together with God's people on a regular basis. If Jesus needed it, if Jesus, the Son of God, needed it, you and I need it as well. Now, I would imagine that at this synagogue, there were lots of people there who were not what they were supposed to be. In fact, I know that's the case because of what I'm about to bring up in the next couple of slides. There were people there who were gossips. There were people there who were hypocrites. There were people there who were just making a show of religion. And everything there was not what it was supposed to be. Let me just say this. Anytime you get any group of people together of any size, there are going to be people there who are not what they are supposed to be. But Jesus, still knowing that there was a lot lacking in that synagogue, it was still his custom. And it shames us today to think, to cause all, bring up all these excuses. Well, there are hypocrites at the landmark Church of Christ. I'm sure there are. There are people there who don't act right. I'm sure that's the case. There are people there who don't say things they should say. I'm sure that's the case. Brothers and sisters, that's no excuse for us not being an active part of assembling on the Lord's Day. This was Jesus' custom, and it should be our custom. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because obviously it's the Lord's Day and you're here. But I think especially during this pandemic, it's easy for us to get out of the habit, isn't it? I know a lot of people have gotten out of the habit. And some aren't coming because... They don't feel comfortable, and I understand that. At least watch it at home. At least watch it on your computer and have a time of devotion with your family so that you can gain support from God's Word. So part of what it means to be filled with the Spirit is to regularly gather with God's people. It was Jesus' custom, and that should continue to be our custom as well. And Jesus stands up to read, and here's what he reads. He's reading from his Old Testament, which was his Bible. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. And he's reading from a scroll from Isaiah chapter 61. And here's what he says. God's Spirit is on me. He has chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor. He has sent me to announce pardon to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burden and the battered free, to announce that this is God's year to act. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Jesus is showing us here, here's what it looks like when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we may wonder, what does it look like today if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit? Jesus is trying to show us. God's Spirit is on me, and he has chosen me to preach the message of God's news, of the good news to the poor. Now, poor, they're poor in a lot of different ways. I think he's talking specifically about those who see their need for God. People who are poor morally, people who are poor spiritually, people who are broken, and it's often those kind of people that we shy away from. And brothers and sisters, our churches have them every Sunday. I promise you, there are people like that here every Sunday and out there in our places of employment, in our neighborhoods and everywhere we go. There are people who are broken and who are poor. And those are the people that Jesus came for and those are the people that we're to be for if we're going to be filled with God's spirit. He's chosen us to announce pardon to the prisoners, people who are captive or who are in bondage, your translation might say. Now, he's not simply talking about God has called us to preach the good news to people who are in prison, though that's part of it. There are people who are in bondage and in captive in a lot of different ways. There are people who are in bondage to materialism, to sensuality, to greed, to hatred, to all kinds of things. And they aren't just people out there. Sometimes there are people who are in here as well. He's called us to preach the good news and recovery of sight to the blind. And once again, it's not just those who are physically blind. There are people who are blind in lots of different ways. Sometimes some of the blindest people are people like us as Jesus is going to show, people who go to church every Sunday. And sometimes we're blinded by the 
religious trappings around us because maybe it is our custom to go to church every Sunday and sometimes we can be blinded to our great need for God. Sometimes we don't see that we're the ones who have need and actually we are. And to the burden and the batter, Jesus came to set them free. Those who have been squashed by the circumstances of life, who life is hard for them. One thing I've learned this past week, Laura and I, the other night, for whatever reason, we're watching an HGTV. We like to watch those fixer-upper shows, not that we've done a lot of fixing up around our house, but we'd like to think we could someday. <laughs> we, were watch we like to watch those HGTV shows, Flip or Flop and Love It or List It, and maybe some of you guys watch those kind of shows. Anyway, in the midst of it, Laura was uh, looking through her computer, and it was sitting on an annual from college. And she gets it out, and she's flipping through there. Oh, you remember these people? Remember those people? And then, for whatever reason, she brought up the name of a, a person who was my roommate at one time, and a real good guy who became a Bible major and uh, later went to graduate school also and became a counselor and all that. Just a really good guy. And we started wondering, I wonder what ever happened to him and his, and his wife, who we both knew and went to church with. Really, really good people. And our, it, it reminded us of about 10, 10 or 12 years ago when we were living in Kentucky. They were living in Nashville. And we got together with them and went out to a restaurant. Tiffany was real little, and they had a son who was just a couple of years older than Tiffany. And we had a good reunion with them and everything. And we just got to wonder what happened to them. Well, you know... If you get on Google these days, you can find out a whole bunch of stuff about people pretty quick. Well, then just, just doing a Google search and putting this guy's name in there, there came up a video of him, and he was at a, a church, and he was giving his testimony before people, and he was, it was heartbreaking to watch it. Here's a man who was a, he's a good guy, real good guy, but even really good people who go to church all the time. This person became a minister was a pulpit preacher. His wife was a church secretary at one time. He has a counseling degree, and he counsels people all the time whose lives are broken, but yet his life had been very broken, and he was just at the end of his rope. His wife had left him. She was having an affair on the side. She had rang up over $50,000 in debt on a credit card that he didn't know anything about. He got remarried about a, less than a year later, that ended in a divorce just a couple of years later, and for whatever reason happened, he lost his job as a counselor. Just a mess. And he was now in a place where he was having to take advantage of transitional housing, kind of like something like the Genesis Center in this other state where he's at now. And it just reminded me of how even people who are good people, and this guy is a good guy, don't we all know that even good people sometimes can get involved in things that really break their lives and they can be really broken and in bondage to things? That doesn't mean they're a bad person. It means their life has taken a course where Satan has really led them in a dark place. And what I want everybody in here to know, this is very important, and trust me, I know, there are people like that who are here every Sunday. Um, you know, when you're a preacher, you find out a bunch of stuff. Be looking for those people. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. A person who is filled with the Spirit is intentionally looking for people who are in need, people that we can minister to and show God's love and mercy and grace to. And when Jesus said this, all the people in the synagogue, they were speaking well of Jesus and they were saying what grace is upon him and what wisdom and insight he has. And they were wondering how did he get this kind of wisdom and insight? I mean, after all, he grew up here in Podunk, Nazareth and his dad was nothing but a lowly carpenter. How did he get this wisdom and insight? And they were speaking very well of them until he said this. Jesus said to these church-going respectable, synagogue-attending people. He said, I assure you, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut up for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land, and yet Elijah wasn't sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many people in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, and yet none one of them was cleansed but only Naaman the Syrian. 
What was Jesus saying? They knew these stories from their Old Testament very well. This is a story from the two stories, one from 1 Kings and one from 2 Kings. The first one about this widow was the story that's told in 1 Kings chapter 17, which they would have known very well. This widow was a Gentile. And this widow was very poor. In fact, she was down to her last meal. She was going to bake a meal just for her and her son, and then they were going to die. And Elijah was sent by God to her. And Elijah tells her to give me your last meal and God will bless you and take care of you. She trusted what Elijah said, even, so, even though she had no physical evidence of it. She trusted what God was saying through Elijah and God used that to take care of this widow. And what Jesus was saying to these people or what they thought he was implying is that this woman, even though she was a Gentile, she trusted God far more than you who are God's supposed people do. And she's far more worthy of my message and of my healing than you are. And they didn't take kindly to that. And he was saying the same thing about this second person that's recorded in 2 Kings chapter 5. His name was Naaman. He was a captain of the Syrian army, also a Gentile, and he was a leper. And he eventually, after some persuading, humbled himself. We sang that song early, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And he humbled himself to dip himself seven times in the dirty Jordan River and he was cleansed and he was healed. In other words, he submitted himself to God and he listened to God and he was cleansed and he was healed even though he was a Gentile. Jesus was implying, and they were right, they took it this way, you're saying that they were more deserving of God's intervention in their life than we are in ours and that is what he was saying and they didn't like it. In fact, it says... All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They were so furious, they took him out of the synagogue and they led him out to the edge of town and they were going to throw him over a cliff. And the Bible says that he just vanished and kind of walked through their midst and was gone. They were furious. This is how a lot of people respond to God's word today. Now I want everybody in here to know something. He's not talking to people out there. He's talking to people like us. See, sometimes people like us who are good church-going people, sometimes people like us who go to church every Sunday and who dress well and have good jobs and maybe are well-educated and live in nice homes and are respectable, sometimes we are the most needy people. Our problem is which is what the problem of these people in the synagogue had. Their problem is they didn't see that they were needy, and that's really the worst problem that there is. I found a great story this week in one of the sources I was using to prepare this lesson. It was a story of a very prestigious British church, and this church had three mission churches under their care, and on the first Sunday of each year, their habit was that all the mission churches would come to this prestigious British church for a combined communion service. Despite all their backgrounds and their education and income differences, they all would kneel side by side during this communion service. Well, on one of these, the pastor of the prestigious British church, he saw a former burglar who was kneeling beside a judge of the Supreme Court of England. And it was the same judge who sent this burglar to jail where he served a seven-year sentence. And after the service, the judge was walking out with the pastor. And the judge said to the pastor, he said, did you notice who was kneeling beside me at the communion service this morning? And then there was kind of silence as they continued to walk on. And finally the judge said, what a miracle of grace. And the, and the pastor nodded in agreement and he said, yes, it, it is a miracle of grace. And the judge asked the pastor, to whom are you referring? Well, the pastor said, I'm referring to the former convict, of course. And the judge said, I wasn't referring to him. I was referring to myself as being a miracle of grace. And this pastor was confused. He said, what do you mean? I don't understand. And the judge said, well, you see, it's not surprising that the convict received grace. He knew how much he needed it. But look at me. I was taught from infancy to live as a gentleman, that my word was to be my bond, that I was to say my prayers, I was to go to church, I was to take communion, and on and on. I went through Oxford, I obtained degrees, I became a lawyer and eventually a judge. I was sure that all I needed to be, that I was all I needed to be, 
And though, in fact, I was a sinner too. And he said, Pastor, it was God's grace that drew me and opened my heart, and I am the greater miracle. And I think that's a danger for all of us. We're all respectable people. We look nice. We have good jobs. We live in nice homes and all that. But we all are in need of God's grace, aren't we? And sometimes it is us respectable people who, like these synagogue attenders, get so angry at Jesus for what he is trying to say to all of us. We need to know that we are all in need. You know, I was reminded of this uh, in living person a couple of times in my life. I remember a long time ago, uh, Laura and Tiffany and I went to an interview at a church, for that was a potential ministry job for us, in another state a long time ago. And I remember the first question the three or four elders asked me was, what is your dress code? What they were concerned about more than anything was, are you going to wear a suit and tie every day? I thought that was pretty shallow. And then some other things they said, I, I pretty much knew, you know, I, our mindset is not on the same page. But what really did it was the next day at church, I wasn't teaching the Bible class, but Laura and I were in a Bible class. And the dis whole discussion of the Bible class, as we sat there and didn't say a word until the end, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't not say anything. The whole Bible class was them bashing every other church in town, including some other congregations of the Church of Christ. They do this wrong. They're wrong here. They're, they do this wrong. They do this wrong. Every, everybody else in town was wrong, and they, the whole class was just pointing out everything everybody else was doing was wrong, and everybody else is wrong, and therefore they're lost, and yet we're God's people, and God loves us, and we're saved. And I'd had about enough of it. I knew I wasn't going to go to this church anyway, even if they offered it to me. And especially after what I was about to say, I knew they weren't going to offer it to me. And I just raised my hand, and I said, can I say something? They said, sure. They didn't even know who I was. I said, I've been sitting here the whole time, and all I hear is a bunch of judgmentalism towards everybody else. I said, I'd like you to do, do something. Get out your New Testament and read it sometimes and see who Jesus had the harshest condemnations for. And there was silence, and I said, I'll give you the answer, but I hope you'll go check. He had the harshest condemnations for religious people like you and me who have an ad attitude of judgmentalism like I've witnessed in this class today. And that's all I said. And there was silence and crickets for about 20, 30 seconds. And then they continued to go on bashing everybody. And we didn't go to that church, and I'm glad we didn't. I don't want to be a part of a church that's all about judgmentalism and looking down on everybody else and not seeing that we also are in need of God's grace. Another time, a phone interview I had with another church out in Arizona. And I know I've mentioned this before, but this caught, it just caught me as so odd. We were talking, and the interview was going along pretty well. Until they asked me, they said, well, what is your philosophy of ministry? And I told them my philosophy of ministry, which I try to make it as much like Jesus as I can. Uh, it's about ministering to sinners and reaching out to people who are lost and in need of God's grace, those who are part of a church and those who aren't part of a church. And I said, you know, we try to minister to sinners. And they said, direct quote, I'll never forget this, the, phone and the elders and others who were on their committee, they said, you let sinners in your church? And it just caught me flat-footed, and I didn't know what else to say. I said, sir, we don't have any choice here. That's all we have to deal with where we're at, including me. And that was about the end of the interview. <laughs> I knew at that point, I don't want to be a part of that church either. They didn't see themselves as sinners. Brothers and sisters, those of us who are part of the Lord's body, we also are sinners in need of God's grace. And these people who were a part of this synagogue didn't see that. They got so angry with Jesus. But after this, it says he went down to Capernaum. He goes to a different town, about 20 miles away, in Galilee. And on the Sabbath, he also was at the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he taught the people, and they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. Completely different response also from a group of church-going people at a synagogue. They received Jesus' message. It reminds me of that verse I brought up at the beginning of the sermon, Acts 17, 11. 
They received the word with all eagerness, and they examined the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. They had an attitude of God's word applies to me also. It's not just for those people out there. I am also in need of God's grace. And then the Bible goes on to talk about how right after this, Jesus, in the synagogue, it says in verse 33, I'm not going to bring the verse up, but in the synagogue there was a man who was possessed by a demon. Now I want to make a point. This was a person who was in their synagogue. He was in their midst. And he was possessed by a demon. He had some very unclean things going on. And Jesus cast out that demon and healed him. The point I want to make is, as I said earlier, brothers and sisters, make no mistake about this. Every Sunday there are people here who are part of our church, who are sitting in these pews, who are also have some things going on in their life that they need to be cleansed of. Make no mistake about it. Some of those sometimes are us. And we need to be open to the cleansing and the healing power of Jesus. And then it says right after that, they did what we also do. Right after that, they go out to eat. They went to Peter's home. Peter invited Jesus to his home. Peter's mother-in-law apparently lived there with him. And she was sick with a fever, a high fever. And Jesus laid his hands on her and he healed her. The point is, everywhere Jesus goes and everything that he's about, he's about blessing people's lives. That's what it means to have the Spirit of God on you. And this verse, verse 40, kind of sums up what Jesus' life was about. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses and laying his hands on each one of them, he healed them. One other thing that was very unusual about Jesus, he laid his hands on people to heal them. Did you know you don't find that in the Old Testament? This was very unusual. What it shows is Jesus, he wasn't just doing this because he was the Son of God. Jesus really cared about people. It showed his compassion and his mercy and his grace for people, and they felt that the human touch is very, very important. In a nutshell, Jesus' whole life was about being filled with the Spirit of God, and what it meant to be filled with the Spirit of God was to go around blessing the lives of people, those who were blind, those who were captive and in bondage to various things, those who were poor in various different kinds of ways, those who were blind to their own needs, whether they were religious people or not religious people. That's what his whole life was about. And one other thing that shows what it means to be filled with the Spirit, which we all need to hear, and that's this. When day came... After Jesus had done all this ministry, he left and he went to a secluded place. And Mark's version of it gives us a little more detail. It says what Jesus was doing when he goes out to this secluded place is he is praying there. See, it was Jesus' regular habit. This is part of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not going to be able to do effective ministry for anybody if you and our, ourselves, if we are not being filled up with God's Holy Spirit. If we're not spending time alone with God in prayer and in Bible study and allowing him to fill us, there's no way that we're going to be able to minister to other people. This was Jesus' regular habit. This was his custom. So as I sum all this up, this is the one thing I think that these passages are showing what we need to be about. Here's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. When I'm filled with the Spirit, Jesus is in charge and I recharge. Jesus is in charge of my life. My life is about doing his mission, and his mission is about ministering to needy people, and there are needy people everywhere, including in churches. What I want us all to get into the habit of is this, because we're all creatures of habit, aren't we? We have good habits and we have bad habits. One of our bad habits, and I say me, I'm included right there with you, is even when we come to church, we tend to do the same kind of things. And churches like this, in little towns like this, are largely clan churches. And here's what I mean. There are large clans of big families in this church. And that's a wonderful thing, if you're part of that family. But sometimes what we have a tendency to do, let's admit it, we all have to do, we all kind of do that. Don't we have a tendency to kind of group around the people that we know the best? We look for the people that we know the best, and we sit by the people that we know the best. We kind of always sit in the same places all the time. Have you ever noticed that? It might be a good idea to move around some 
and to get to know everybody in this church, regardless of which side or in the middle, wherever they sit. But I want us to get into the habit of doing this. Brothers and sisters, trust me, I know this is true. I guarantee you it's true. Every Sunday it's true. Don't miss the people in this church who need to be ministered to. There are hurting people here every Sunday. They might not look like it. Like my friend from college that I mentioned earlier, he was a preacher, his wife was a church secretary, had degrees and all that. Everything looked good, but oh, deep down, they were hurting. Things weren't going well. There are people like that here every Sunday. And all you have to do is pay attention. Get into the habit of looking for people who look like they need a friend. Looking for people who look like they might need some help. And if you pay close attention and pray and ask God to show you who they are, I believe he'll lead you to them. Get into the habit of ministering to people. That's part of what it means to being filled with the Spirit. And what's largely going to help us to do that is if we're spending time with God in prayer like Jesus did, we're recharging. When we do that, God will show us who those people are. This last verse I'm going to bring up is kind of a summation of Jesus' life, and it's our challenge for all of us as we leave here today. As you know, this passage in Acts says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And then he's going to say, here's what that looked like when he anointed him with the Holy Spirit. He went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. That sums up what Jesus' life was about. Wherever he was, whatever he was doing, whether it was in the synagogue, whether it was out there in the marketplace, wherever he was, he went around doing good, and he was healing all, blessing people who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him, because he recharged his life all the time. And his life, his ministry was all about doing the ministry that God had called him to do. That's what God's asking us to do. So I want us all to get into the habit of thinking about this especially. Every time we come in here, whether it be Sunday morning or Wednesday night, or when our Bible classes start in a little over a month from now, or when eventually we will start Sunday night back, hopefully at some point in the future. Get into the habit of looking for people here even who need God and who need ministered to, and they're here every Sunday. And when you leave here today, be looking for people. When you go to the restaurant, if you're going to a restaurant right after this, there are people at the restaurant. Maybe your waiter or your waitress could be blessed by your ministry to them. Let's just get into the habit of having the Spirit of the Lord upon us. And that's what it means. That's what it looks like when God's Spirit is upon us in our life. I hope this message has been a blessing to you today. I hope it's opened your eyes a little bit to what it means to be filled by the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be a Christian. In fact, in the New Testament, the chief characteristic of a Christian, number one, is they are filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, there's a verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 9 that says that anyone who does not have the Spirit of God does not belong to him. The chief characteristic of a Christian is they are filled with the Spirit. Hopefully we've seen today what does that look like, and hopefully that's what it will look like in our life. If you need to respond to the Lord in any kind of way today, maybe you need to change your life, maybe you need to repent of some things to allow the Spirit of God to work in you. If we can help you, pray for you, counsel with you in any kind of way today, Please allow us to do that. Let's all stand as we sing this song. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restore. My heart is weary, please help me.
Well, we want to thank all of you for coming out to our worship service this morning. Whether you're a member, you're visiting in person, or you are watching this online, we're glad that you were here, and we hope you were uplifted and encouraged by your time of worship with us this morning. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure you fill out a visitor's information card. Uh, it's in the back of the pew in front of you, and you can leave it in one of the offering baskets in the back of the auditorium as you leave. And we hope you come back any time that we meet. If you haven't already, make sure you grab a copy of this week's bulletin. There's tons of good information in there, uh, prayer requests, activities that are going to be going on, uh, Bible classes that will be starting up soon, information for a lot of different things. Um, just got a couple of announcements I'd like to highlight. For the youth group, junior high and high school, we will be having Roundhouse this afternoon from 4 to 7 p.m. at Chad and Janie Hill's house out in Canton. You'll see the bulletin there for more details if you'd like. And also a reminder that this is the last Sunday to sign up for the Kaufman County Blood Drive here at Landmark on Saturday, February 13th. And everyone who donates uh, blood is going to receive a $20 Uber Eats gift card. So you can get you a meal out of that. And there's a QR code in your bulletin uh, for you to sign up and get more details about that. There's also going to be a baby shower table that's set up in the foyer just outside these back doors for Cody and Abby Brantley. They're expecting a girl and they are registered at Walmart and Amazon. And our college care package ministry has selected Antonio Taylor for the college student that they're going to try to bless this month. And so a list of all his favorite items are in the bulletin. And so if you'll see that list and make some purchases for him, I'm sure he would be grateful for those things. And we encourage everyone to check our bulletin for additional announcements and prayer requests. And like I said, we do have our offering baskets in the back. So if you'll leave your offering there for our members um, as you leave the auditorium this morning. Let's say a prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you, for the opportunity uh, to have the gift of salvation that you have so freely given through the death of your Son on the cross. We pray that we take, my, take Mike's lesson to heart this week and through the rest of this year that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit and be more like Jesus in our actions, our thoughts, our relationships, and within our community. Help us to be a good example, just as Jesus was to those around us. And it's through him we pray. Amen.